Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last uh, side event that we have as part of Global Offshore Wind Summit Taiwan Virtual, uh, which is a side event organized by NORWEP on floating offshore wind. So this will be uh, an exciting session on a really um, exciting emerging technology. So uh, this session, I'll pass it off to John Dukstad from NORWEP. Uh, who will kick things off. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alyssa, and thank you for helping us organize uh, this uh, exciting uh, event uh, and discussion around uh, the current status of floating wind. Uh, my name is, is, as you said, Alyssa, uh, John Dukstad. I'm a director in wind and solar at Norwegian Energy Partners, and I'm heading the efforts uh, with you on uh, floating wind as well as offshore wind in general. Uh, two words first to uh, Norwegian energy partners. Uh, we are uh, a independent non-profit foundation established to strengthen the long-term basis for value creation in Norway for the Norwegian industry. But we do also work with the international global industries in terms of finding collaboration to drive offshore wind and floating wind forwards. We have roughly 280 to 300 partner companies with which we work with to uh, create more innovative uh, approaches to the industry. We have founders from the whole Norwegian uh, energy industry, uh, even though even also the trade unions, and we are supported by the government in Norway and by the largest industrial co corporations in addition to all our partners, which are course, uh, companies in Norway as well. We do combine the competence we have in Norway in the offshore sector from the oil and gas and from the maritime industries over uh, 100 years or 40 years in the oil and gas industry. And we try to combine that uh, with the international energy needs, but also with your competence in Taiwan, in this case, for floating or for offshore wind. Uh, to collaborate to create the best solutions uh, for the best projects uh, in offshore wind. Now with that, uh, I have a short uh, film which I'd like to uh, share with you uh, because it's also uh, something which we uh, think would be uh, slightly motivating uh, to the session we are uh, currently uh, doing. Just give me a second. Generations of mastering extreme ocean conditions has given Norwegian suppliers a unique engineering and marine competence. Offshore wind energy really started in the North Sea. That is because there were good governments that really liked those type of technologies. We are proud in Norway of the creativity and innovation of the offshore energy industry. There's a new revolution coming using floating technologies for offshore wind. That will allow us to go further offshore, hunt better wind speeds in deeper waters, and reduce the environmental footprint further. Our skilled supply chain is creating innovative and efficient cost reduction solutions and better services. Norway has value to add in offshore wind. We're open to collaboration and the Norwegian offshore industry's strong reputation in health and safety standards makes us a trusted partner in this global development. Norwegian offshore expertise, taking offshore wind further. Thank you. Um, and um, as you can see on the speaker slide uh, just in front of you, we are not all Norwegians and uh, luckily we have uh, been able to collaborate with uh, Carbon Trust in creating this program for you. And we've also been so lucky to have uh, MAF uh, from uh, GWEC uh, participating uh, so that we get uh, a proper uh, global view of the offshore wind and floating wind in this case. Uh, industry. Faisi, welcome to us. You are a senior associate with Carbon Trust and you will talk about the market industry in trends, technology challenges uh, and covered by the CT calls lately. Um, yes. For all of those listening, um, if you have questions to Faisi or any other of the uh, partic uh, participating speakers, uh, please write those down in the chat and we will try to address them. If not, speaker will address them afterwards. 
Paisi, please, the screen is yours. Go ahead. Thanks very much, John. I will start sharing. Um, and I hope you can see that OK. Yeah, so as John mentioned, uh, my name is Faisi from the Carbon Trust. Um, and I will speak about floating wind industry, current state of play, and certain technology challenges. Um, so this won't be all of the technology challenges covered um, that, that's facing floating wind, but it will be just some of the key challenges that we've identified and that we work on in our R&D programs. Um, just a brief mention of introduction on the Carbon Trust. I haven't included any, any slides due to the limited time, but for those of you who don't know, the Carbon Trust is a, a not-for-profit mission-driven um, consultancy company based in, headquartered in London with offices in, in around the world. I'm personally based in London. Um, and our mission is, is to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy um, in many fields. Uh, but we've been particularly active in, in offshore wind um, for the past 10 years, um, running several R&D programs, industry-led R&D programs um, on offshore wind. And today I will focus on the floating wind uh, joint industry program and, and what's covered in, therein. Um, so just a brief background on, on floating wind itself and the current state of the industry. I'm sure that this is not new for many people who know uh, about the status of offshore wind. Um, but just to make the point that floating wind is still very much in its infancy uh, when compared to fixed bottom offshore wind. So currently the installed capacity worldwide is only about 100 megawatts, which compares to about 30 gigawatts for fixed bottom offshore wind. And all of the projects so far have been small scale, um, small scale demonstration or pilot projects rather than commercial scale projects. So our aim at the Carbon Trust in our R&D program is to really try and accelerate the move to large scale, commercial scale um, floating wind farms, which I will mention um, in more detail. Um, so that was the, the kind of current status and now for our kind of predictions for the future. Uh, so this, this analysis is included in our floating wind uh, JIP phase two summary report, which I will draw on heavily today. Uh, which is a public report so i would encourage all of you to to google that and to download and read it um <clears throat> and so yeah we basically predict that roughly we'll see 70 gigawatts of floating wind by 2040 so um kind of fairly i think a fairly kind of aggressive prediction um and we see that this decade will still be kind of the small scale pilot projects um and to the first half of this decade and the second half of this decade we'll start to see the larger scale projects and then by the 2030s we'll see fully utility scale floating wind farms on par with the fixed bottom offshore wind um, that we're seeing currently um, and you can see from the graph that we we see that growth will be mostly driven by a few certain countries a few european countries uk france um, and in asia japan and south korea have a very strong potential for floating wind and are quite focused on it uh, but of course other countries um, taiwan um, China, other Southeast Asian countries as well, um, could very much start to take floating wind very seriously um, in the same way that other countries are um, after developing fixed bottom uh, offshore wind more generally. Um, so moving on straight on to talk about our R&D uh, program. So the floating wind joint industry projects, the objective, as I mentioned, is to investigate the challenges and opportunities for large scale floating wind farms. So it's very much focused on which technology areas are currently um, kind of lacking or, or prohibitively expensive, um, making large scale commercial scale uh, projects more difficult. Um, and on the left hand side, you can see the, the kind of the five areas that we identified at the beginning of the program as key areas for floating wind that need more, more research. Um, so these are electrical systems, mooring systems, um, logistics, turbine foundation optimization and asset integrity. So within each of these, we'll do several projects, um, uh, which I will, I'll show in a minute. And uh, the participating developers are the companies you can see on, on the right hand side. Um, so I won't go through this, all of these projects. This is a lot of detail, but this is just to give you an overview of all the projects um, that we have done so far and that we're currently doing. Um, so we are currently in phase four. Um, so those projects are ongoing. And today I will talk about um, the results of the phase two projects because, as I mentioned, the phase two summary report was published in July um, and that is publicly available um, 
So today I'm really going to give a summary of the summary. So just very brief because I only have a very short period of time. So I would encourage you to, to read that report. So these, these four areas, dynamic export cable development, requirements and foundation scaling. So these were initial studies to kind of pinpoint what are the technology problem areas. Um, and then now for some of these areas, we're doing more detailed studies to actually look more detail into what the solutions are and what technologies are required in more detail. Um, but these studies, yeah, as I say, are kind of uh, fairly high level kind of initial looks at the, the industry as a whole um, and what is needed in these areas. So I'll go through each of them um, very briefly, just to mention. Um, so the first area is, uh, is turbines, floating winds, so obviously a very key area for any offshore wind farm. Uh, so generally speaking, in our in our R and D programs, we don't often look at the turbines so much because generally turbine R and D is very much um, focused on the the several OEMs that are very dominant in in turbine manufacturing, and we we kind of have less um, influence in a way over the direction of R and D of turbines. However, however, flow for floating wind, it was considered that um, it's a really important area to to look into because the current designs are very much um, based on fixed bottom offshore wind. So one key area was basically just to to look at whether or not the same design can be used for floating wind or what modifications will be required to the design. And the other question, the other main question was around scaling. So as we scale up to, to larger turbines um, for fixed bottom offshore wind, we're starting to see 12, 13 megawatts, and that's definitely going to grow to 15, 20 megawatts. Um, for floating wind, whether this will be an issue to scale up and how well the floating foundations scale with the increased size in, in turbine. Um, so just very simply, the, the results of this study were that um, there are no major reasons why the same basic design cannot be used, um, but certain modifications will be required, um, notably to the tower because of the increased loads uh, from the floating motion on the tower and also to the control systems. Um, in order to uh, avoid negative damping on the floating platform. Um, and in terms of scaling, we found that essentially uh, the floating platform scale very well um, in the sense that the, as the turbine capacity increases, the mass and thus the cost of the, of the floating platforms increases by a much lower ratio. And thus it's very beneficial for cost um, to scale up. Uh, moving on to heavy lift operations, so this is another important area for, for um, offshore wind in general, um, but for floating wind, um, in some cases, of course, for floating wind, uh, port side assembly is possible, uh, but this is not always possible because of port limitations, uh, and in that case, you need to do assembly and also O&M in very challenging deep sea conditions, um, and so in some cases, you're kind of very limited, uh, your options are very limited, and you, you have to use floating crane vessels. Um, and these are very, um, the number of these worldwide is quite limited and thus the cost is very high. So this is kind of a prohibitively costly area. Um, and so this study kind of looked at globally what vessels are currently available uh, and what their limitations are. And we found that um, lift height is a very key limitation currently when moving to larger turbines. So for the larger size, 15 and then even higher 20 megawatt turbines, uh, there are very few vessels that are capable that have the, the necessary lift height to, to do the installation. Um, and obviously, because of the increased motion, you have the motion of the floating platform and the and the floating vessel, uh, you need improved motion compensation. So various areas were identified as needing um, more demonstration or more R&D. Um, moving on then to dynamic export cable development. So um, this is another key area for floating wind. So um, medium voltage dynamic array cables are market ready, um, but for commercial scale floating winds in terms of export cable, we will require high voltage dynamic export cables um, to transmit power from the substation to the, to the shore. Um, and although high voltage dynamic export cables have been used in some um, cases worldwide, uh, they've been made to order and thus have been very expensive. So what we want to see is commercial, commercially ready um, designs. Um, and as you move to high voltage uh, for dynamic export cables, um, there are various design challenges. Um, so this initial study was looking at what are the key challenges in the design. Um, and uh, one of the areas um, we found is that when we move to high voltage, uh, you move to a dry type 
um, cable as opposed to a wet type, uh, meaning that you need the water resistant sheath and that that is one of the areas, one of the components that's the most susceptible to fatigue. So that's one of the key design challenges. Um, and as part of this project, we selected five designs from five cable manufacturers who, are, who you can see on the right hand side of the screen, um, all from different countries around the world. Um, and their designs, uh, we've been supporting the development of the designs um, in order to help them get to to become commercially ready. Uh, and that's ongoing. Um, and the results of that will be as part of uh, phase three of the floating wind JAP. Uh, final area is then monitoring and inspection. Um, so monitoring inspection obviously is a very important area for offshore wind more generally, um, but for floating wind, you have increased challenges. So you have many novel elements um, and many moving parts. Uh, as you can see in the diagram there, obviously you have uh, the dynamic cables, you have the mooring systems, um, and obviously failure of any of these parts uh, is gonna cause um, problems and uh, losses. Um, so monitoring inspection is a very key area. Um, and what the study looked at, um, one of the key areas it looked at was currently what is required by classification societies in terms of inspection. Um, and what we found was that there isn't really a, an agreed, um, there isn't really agreement in terms of what requirements there are um, among classification societies and that currently full physical inspection is required by some, uh, by some of them, which is obviously going to be very timely, time consuming and costly for for very large scale floating wind farms. Um, so one of the, the recommendations from this was that we have to move towards uh, sampling regimes and, and risk-based monitoring and also uh, to do more remote monitoring um, rather than more physical inspection, um, but that more technology development is needed in those areas. Um, I think I'm kind of going over time a little bit, don't wanna go over time too much, so I will basically end there, just to go back to this slide, um, just to say that, um, as I mentioned, currently we're in phase four. These are the projects that are currently ongoing, um, but the phase three um, projects are currently um, closing and the summary report for phase three will be completed end of this year or beginning of next year, and that will be made public and there'll be an announcement for that as well. So I would um, encourage you to also watch that space and, read that report when it comes out because there'll be lots of useful information there um yeah that's well, thank you so much uh, Faisi. i'm sorry to drop in there but uh, we are running a bit of time as you said so i think yeah. we should leave uh, thank you for those uh, interesting highlights uh, for the trend and history of the industry and also for those challenges that you are um Addressing. So, uh, Maf, uh, you are uh, from your vice chair of the Floating Offshore Wind Task Force at GWEC. Uh, and you will tell us a bit about the work you are doing in that task force and also about the challenges that you have identified. So, we are excited to hear more about that. Please, the screen is yours. Great. Thank you, John. So, um, I want to talk about the work GWEC is doing to help coordinate and accelerate floating offshore wind around the world. Um, I, I'm the vice chair of a new task force set up, chaired by Henrik Stiesdahl, um, builds on the work of an existing very successful task force on offshore wind chaired by Alistair Dutton. We wanted to focus more on what, um, what GWEC needs to do to support our members in floating offshore wind. I also work with GWEC coordinating an initiative called OPRO, which is about the acceleration and support for policy and regulatory work around the globe which is fixed and floating offshore wind. Um, I won't go into that, but any more questions on that, please do use the chat or contact me separately. So um, in terms of GWEC's own projections, slightly more conservative than the Carbon Trust, but there are a range of projections out there. Um, we published our recent global offshore wind market report um, in, over the summer, looking at what's gonna happen at 2030. Um, we project approximately uh, if you look at global growth, you can see growth in across those different markets in fixed. Um, a, lo a lot of offshore wind growing, not just in the European market, but out into Asia and, China, and Asia, including China, um, with North America starting to come through, but still growth focused on a, on a few markets. 45% of installations still being, being within Europe. And if you look at the different regional growth of that, you can see growth in Europe. Asia, 
the North America split out there. So what we're seeing across 2020s is growth widening out more participating countries, but still dominated by fixed and still dominated by the, the major um, European markets and China with emerging markets, of course, in Vietnam, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, and towards the end of the decade, India. And within floating, we see um, a forecast of 6.2 gigawatts. There's a range of forecasts, as I say, out there from 3 to 19 gigawatts. The carbon trust hours probably towards the middle. Um, the critical thing, I think, to flag is that almost all of this comes in a lot at the end of the decade. So the 2020s is very much about getting ready, starting to scale up, and moving from those demonstration to commercial deployment. Um, and our projection shows that half of that six gigawatts is going to be delivered in the last two years of the decade. Um, and if you look at out past 2030, you can see some more substantial growth. So as you've heard, the carbon trusts forecast of 70 gigawatts by 2040. Only 10 of that, the carbon trust thinks, is by 2030. So 2030 and onwards is about deployment and delivery. And we'll, we'll see rapid scaling up and extension out into new markets. And we can see, of course, that new markets will come in into offshore wind. So this shows you work from the World Bank. Um, they are working with GWEC to support emerging markets. There are a series of initial country assessments being done. Uh, this shows you a highlights of those, um, looking at Brazil, India, Morocco, Philippines, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Turkey, and Vietnam. And the work of GWEC and the World Bank is very much about helping new markets come learn about offshore wind, help them to accelerate, give them the resources and support so they can develop. But here, if you look at that table, you can see that all of those countries have significant fixed and floating um, capabilities, um, and some have um, very significant floating uh, potential. So if we're serious about offshore wind growth and if, if we're serious about involving new markets, we need to also be looking at how we can support those countries understand floating offshore wind. So uh, we've over summer established a task force. The aim of that is to accelerate growth of offshore wind. So we have a group of industry leaders who are working to champion and drive forward industry action. Hendrix Diesel is kindly chairing that task force um, with myself as vice chair. And that task force is feeding into the existing work of GUX, such as the, the offshore wind task force and the regional task forces that are set up, such as, for example, the Japanese task force. The focus is on different markets in Europe, also Asia, of course, and North America. We're initially looking at UK, France, Portugal, Spain, Norway, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, West Coast, US, and Canada. And we're going through a prioritization, um, uh, a sifting process at the moment, looking at essentially the potential in those markets, the policy frameworks that exist or don't exist, and looking at where we can share learning. We're working and engaging with those different governments and the relevant national associations um, and other key stakeholders, for example, with Wind Europe, IRENA, um, AWIA, et cetera. And then we plan to work and expand dialogue, building on the existing work of the task force and those regional task forces with the relevant NGOs and other stakeholders. And we'll help promote the work of floating and the product of the task force through engaging in seminars such as this, uh, bespoke events for the task force on floating, etc. So I think that, that's a very good, um, useful summary of what we're doing. I'm conscious of time, but please do um, engage with GWEC if you're interested on the floating task force or the wider offshore task force. I'm happy to um, take comments in the chat or do contact me. The aim of our task force is to add value. Um, there are a lot of initiatives in the world, but GWEC's USP, if you like, is the ability to connect industry um, with international groups and engage with national governments. Um, we have a, a good solid track record of how we, we can help resolve policy challenges in emerging markets. And we see there's a critical need to do that and floating over the next few years. So our aim is to bring industry together uh, and avoid duplication of efforts um, and maximize the chances of success and growth in floating. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Math. Uh, very interesting uh, to hear that you are engaging in the way you are to uh, deploy more floating wind uh, in the new markets uh, going forward as well. And uh, of course, uh, from a Norwegian perspective, the work you are doing is uh, highly 
uh, important and also interesting. So please let us know if we can support the work you are doing uh, in that task force also. Thank you. Now, uh, one issue, of course, to discuss with uh, these, uh, both uh, the industry and uh, governments uh, might be risk. And uh, risk is an issue in floating wind as it is in offshore wind. And we've got uh, Mr. Magnus Ebbesen from uh, DMEGL. He's the business lead for floating wind in the, that organization. And Magnus, you will talk about uh, risk mitigation for offshore wind. Uh, please, uh, the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you. uh, so thanks a lot for allowing me to, to speak here today. I will talk about floating wind and risk mitigation, or or how we say it in DMGL, how we can commercialize floating wind with uh, confidence. So DMGL is a, a trusted advice uh, in, in the floating wind industry. We have played a role in 97% of, of the global offshore wind projects. 80% of the offshore wind projects today has been certified by DMGL. Within floating wind, we have been active in 10 years. We have a leading position in developing requirements and standards. Floating wind, we are actively involved in, in floating wind uh, transactions. Uh, we have been involved in nine, nine projects so far. We have 150 years experience in managing risk of offshore technologies. We are in more than 100 countries and 50% of the eight first floating wind farms are designed according to, to our standard. And we really believe uh, as a company that the future is floating. Um, we, every year we do a uh, big analysis uh, called the energy transition outlook. And in our analysis, we, we expect more than 250 gigawatt of floating wind in 2050, which is one fifth of all offshore wind installed. Um, and how? what is 250 gigawatt? Well, now in Norway, we are building one of the biggest floating wind farm to date, uh, the Hive in Tampen of 88 megawatt. 250 gigawatt is 3000 of this. Uh, wind farm. So basically, it's going to be a, a big industry. But to really to get to that place, there's there's some challenges that need to be overcome. One thing is the cost. We really need to get the cost down. But also another thing is the confidence. We need to get trust in technology. We need to mitigate the risk. We we in the MGL we predict that the floating wind cost will go down almost seventy percent towards twenty fifty, with an average average global price of forty euro per megawatt. We, we don't think floating wind on average will be as low as bottom fixed, but we don't we don't think it is needed either because many areas you can't install bottom fix and other areas floating wind will come more and more as the kind of the easy bottom fixed areas are, are being used up. When it comes to confidence or risk, there are there are some new risks that need to be managed with floating wind. You have many, many new markets. Floating wind is, is popping up areas where they don't have a bottom fix, maybe not oil and gas activities or onshore wind. Um, you have new technologies. Uh, so carbon trust presented, we need, we need R&D, we need the cost to get down. New mooring solutions, new cables, uh, new, new ways of fabricating and installing. There will come a lot of new technologies, but this also will increase the risk. Floating wind is now moving a lot, moving has been is building a lot in Europe, but also will will quickly move to other conditions, deeper waters, uh, typhoons, uh, seismic activities, other ground conditions, etc. There are new conditions that will also impact the risk. And last, going to norm, new markets would also uh, impact the players that that will be involved. Uh, there will be because of geographical constraints. But also we see a kind of a transition of, of oil and gas majors or, or, or players from the maritime industry moving towards, towards uh, cleaner energies such as, uh, as floating wind. And of course that also comes with, comes with benefits, but also with, with some new risks. And floating wind also has some specific, uh, specific challenges. And I think uh, uh, Carbon Trust also presented quite, quite well on this, but, but these are something that needs to be concerned when, when building a floating wind project. The turbine will move more, more than it will be doing, done on a bottom fixed wind, wind farm. This needs, to be, this needs to be handled. So that's the turbine controller. The power curve might be impacted. We also, a bit uncertainty, will the turbine have the same reliability as it would be on a bottom fixed? On electrical, that was also touched up earlier. Instead of having uh, more static cables as bottom fixed, you will now have cables that, that moves, dynamic cables. And, uh, and this, of course, 
is, is something that new we don't have that experience with. Also floating substation is, is another, another aspect which is new. On the substructure and station keeping, well, this is of course is something that we, it's similar to what is doing in, in oil and gas, but for, for, floating, for floating wind, you have some different loads and you have a very different requirements to cost and, and you also need to zero produce. So this adds on risk. And, that, and it's and floating wind is not only just the technology risk with the turbine and structure itself, it's also things related to the site, it's related to the, the, the pro project, the contracts, uh, the organization and also also the market that that is on this. So how do you so how do you manage this risk? Well, we can we can look at what is the experience from other industries. Can you leverage something from bottom fixed wind and oil and gas towards floating wind? Yes, I think there's a lot to to learn, but there, but there are some differences. This table here shows uh, kind of a, a qualitatively assessment of the relevant experience in various various parts of a floating wind farm, considering uh, the, the volume and similarities in oil and gas and, uh, and bottom fixed wind. And what you see is for design and fabrication, it's only the tower and export cable where we consider the experience high. When installation is only the mooring and anchoring and ex export cables, we consider the experience high. In operation, it's only the normal VTG maintenance, we consider the experience high. All other er areas, we consider the experience medium or low. For example, mooring and anchoring, there's there's a lot of experience in, in oil and gas. However, for floating wind, there's a different mooring arrangement. Instead of having 10 or 12 uh, mooring lines, you just have three. There's a different a different load. And of course, as mentioned, also a different cost requirement. So therefore, there are, are some challenges. And this is something that, of course, when you investing and build in floating wind, you really need to, to take into account. But the floating wind has has an ability to to manage risk, and I think it, there are two projects already installed today. Hive in Scotland has shown promising capacity factors. This is for the, the first three months, and now we also have have the Windfloat Atlantic installed with a different type of float technology. So so basically, we can we can build floating wind. We can manage the risk. Windfloat Atlantic is also quite special as it is. Um, uh, is project finance. So, so here you also have had banked, uh, banks and a bit more uh, diligent due diligence process. So, uh, and it still come through that, and, and that also shows that that really risks can be managed. So, so how do you, how do you reduce and manage risk? Well, we believe it's a lot is done if you just follow the best best practice in project development, and that's a sure relevant experience in the, in in development team, experience from oil and gas and from from uh, bottom fixed wind. Is, is really important. Do proper site investigation, really understand the, the, the site and the soil conditions, select a proven floater technology and mature turbine design, design according to respected industry standards, have the designs and construction certified, verified, really define the, the interfaces, the interfaces well. Floating wind, of course, has more components and it's also more complex interfaces. Really understand that it's important. Choose experienced contractors, follow up on critical path items, especially the substructure fabrication it takes a lot of time. And if you have a delay that can really impact the rest of the project. And we really seen that as a critical item in the projects we've been involved in. Then you monitor the initial performance and really pre prepared for intervention. Floating wind has some very unique maintenance events, uh, mooring line failure, cable failure, uh, major replacement operation. So these notes really needs to be planned. And then of course, try to really measure and, and really understand the performance of this uh, floating wind farm and feed it back into your organization. And also ideally share the experience with the industry so we really can learn from each other and, and improve uh, as a total. And last, I just wanna mention about the project certification. This is really the kind of the base of managing risk. Having, having the project certified according to respected standards, really ensures that the safety integrity of the of the floating wind farm is assured for the whole lifetime of the project. Um, and that's having someone that looks into the follows up, both the design, the fabrication and the installation and the operation. So thank you. So I have shown some kind of risk today and also hopefully some, some ways to mitigate it. Uh, but I think that the risk that are there is something that really the industry can tackle, and uh, and we we in the MGL really believe that the future is floating. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Magnus. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very exciting to hear. 
Uh, we share many of your views, of course, and uh, good uh, that you are engaged in the floating industry as well uh, from the NDGL. Uh, which uh, you are, of course, uh, based on your offshore wind uh, background. Uh, one of those challenges that you mentioned, uh, the anchoring, uh, is addressed by our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Noel uh, Boylan from uh, NGI, Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. Uh, you're based in Perth, aren't you, uh, Noel, but uh, still uh, at the Norwegian company. You're our <laughs> director of, of that uh, entity. So please, uh, Noel, the screen is yours, and I think you have to enlarge your, your presentation there. Good. You're also good. Go ahead, okay. please. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to talk on uh, anchoring for floating offshore wind. Um, in terms of anchors for offshore wind, there is probably, for floating wind, there's probably three main uh, anchor types uh, shown there on the right-hand side. Starting at the bottom, uh, we have uh, drag embedment anchors. These are a type of anchors that have found most of their application in oil and gas uh, exploration. Uh, drop them on the seabed, apply a load, and they embed into the soil. Um, they're an easy to use anchor, but probably their limitation is when it comes to predicting what their capacity is. And when they're used in a, a long-term situation, such as uh, floating wind, um, how they'll behave over time. Uh, they're less reliable. Um, in the, the middle there, we have pile anchors. Uh, these are similar to the piles that hold many of the fixed bottom platforms uh, already in offshore wind, but just in a slightly dip, different application with a mooring line connected to them. Um, again, can be a very reliable anchor for um, capacity, but the limitation of, of needing to drive them with a hammer into the ground um, can pose problems, particularly uh, environmental issues with mammals. And on the top, we have suction anchors, which are really uh, like a pile anchor, except they're a larger diameter and a, a shorter length. Uh, the attractiveness of this anchor is that they are uh, silent anchor and they can be relatively easy to uh, install. This video just shows an example of their installation. It is a video we developed with Framo, who make the, uh, the pumps to install them, and it's of suction foundations connected to a jacket but the same principle applies to um, a anchor it's lowered onto the seabed uh, penetrates a small amount um, pumps are engaged and they apply an under pressure and suck the foundation into the soil so it can be a very quick and importantly a silent installation and then the pumps can be disconnected and, and move on to the next um, installation Suction install foundations have a, a very long track record, um, first developed in the oil and gas industry in the late 80s and 90s. And an example there, a picture shown of one of the first platforms where they were used, uh, Draufter uh, offshore Norway, uh, that then be used, used for many platforms and also for floating systems, FPSOs, F4SUs, and hundreds and in the thousands now installed around the world. So one of the projects we've involved with recently, Summit in offshore Bangladesh, where um, suction anchors have been used to hold a F4SU there. But since 2014, they've been getting their journey in offshore wind. Um, Orsted installed uh, offshore Germany, a, a suction bucket jacket, so the little figure in the bottom left there. And that was a trial installation. And now they've been used in, 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 in other uh, developments both for Orsted and also for other developers who are um, both designing and have already installed. In floating wind, uh, the main application so far has been the, the high wind development that was mentioned earlier, offshore Scotland in 2017. And this was the world's first floating wind farm and also the deepest water depths, so up to 130 meters. And there was um, up to 15 anchors installed for the five different uh, turbine locations um, and this has proven to be a very successful development very high uh, utilization recorded through uh, since installation uh, you can see on the right a picture of one of those suction anchors before installation and then on the bottom are the results from the installation so the the green and red are the the bounds of the predictions and you can see all the anchors have um, installed uh, well within 
uh, those bands. So that's very positive. Um, they have potential in, in many uh, geographical areas um, around the world. And as floating wind moves into deeper waters with softer soils, they're a, a very appropriate anchor to use. Um, Equinor is now taking this concept further in the, the Highland Tampon project, which is going to install many more uh, turbines, is also going to use uh, suction anchors uh, for the anchors. An important development as we move into um, bigger uh, arrays is the rather than having um, one anchor uh, for every mooring line is actually to share anchors uh, between um, mooring lines. Uh, so as an example here on the right is some research and development work that was done by researchers from the University of Massachusetts where they studied the high wind development and its five turbines and were able to show that you could reduce um, that from 15 down to nine anchors. So a 40% reduction in steel and almost no uh, change in the mooring line length. So this is something which would be very important for floating wind um, as it develops and suction anchors are a very uh, appropriate anchor to use in a, a shared anchor array because of the, the shape of the anchor and its size. And also it's gonna be used in that tampon project um, I mentioned on the last slide. So in summary, um, suction anchors, they're uh, built from a unique experience. A lot of that in Norway and a lot of the supply chain, uh, whether it be from the design side or things like the pumps that uh, Framo have been in, involved in, in many hundreds of the installations, uh, much of that um, experience in Norway. Combination of efficient installation, uh, now very reliable design methods, and also a, a type of anchor that can be quite versatile in design, make them very attractive foundation solution uh, for offshore wind and floating facilities. And development, as I said, the multi-line anchoring will further optimize layouts and, and help to reduce costs. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Noel, for uh, showing us the way in terms of anchoring uh, and uh, the solution to some of the challenges, potentially. Um, our next uh, speaker is taking us uh, into another uh, area of challenge, uh, the cable pull-in systems for floating wind farms. Uh, Mr. Stian Guttormsen, who is Operations Manager at Access, uh, we'll talk about the innovative solutions for these novel challenges. Please, Stian, uh, the screen is yours. Uh, hello, Jon. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of our insights uh, into cable pull-in operations uh, on these uh, floating wind farms. It was very interesting to listen to uh, Magnus from DNV talking about risk, and I'm going to uh, touch on uh, that here as well. It resonated quite well. So here we're trying to bring that a bit more uh, into concrete uh, projects. So first uh, I'll give you a very quick introduction to Access and then we'll start looking at uh, floating wind cable pull-ins. Uh, what's the big deal with that? Uh, okay, it's a bit more complicated, but what does that mean? And finally, we'll look at some uh, lessons learned uh, and some, uh, some solutions. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, please just text them in and then we'll try to respond uh, afterwards. Uh, Access Group uh, has, uh, along with a lot of the other speakers and attendants here, uh, a long history in, uh, in offshore energy industry. Uh, our headquarters are in Norway, uh, quite a large uh, geographic uh, footprint, uh, telltale sign of a, a, a global oil service company. Um, in East Asia, we have offices in Korea and Singapore, uh, and I have a decade of track record uh, working in yards in, in, in both Korea, Thailand, China, and in uh, Singapore. So the renewables department at Access, it draws on the competencies and capabilities uh, of all the, the uh, service lines in Access. Uh, uh, for the case of floating wind cable pull-ins, uh, we bring in our expertise in, in lifting equipment certification and compliance. Uh, we also uh, bring in uh, third-party verif verification and safe lifting operations and, and method developments. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, our material handling products group at uh, Alpa, who've been producing uh, specialized cranes and winches uh, for the offshore industry for, for many years. So floating uh, 
uh, wind cable pull-ins. What's the big deal? Uh, we've carried out cable pull-ins and umbilical pull-ins uh, in the offshore uh, sphere for, for decades. Uh, what changes uh, when these uh, turbines go floating? So let's uh, start at a high level, start at the top and, and, and go through some of the aspects uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding this. First of all, uh, uh, we have a, it's a new industry. We have new concepts, new actors, and, and new designs at play. Uh, secondly, uh, some might uh, agree and some might disagree with me here. Uh, this, the standards and regulations governing uh, floating wind are, are, are still under development and, and immature at this stage. So already there is a, an inherent heightened risk to these operations. And, and as uh, Magnus from DNB said, uh, to to most of the other operations that happen on floating wind farms. Uh, secondly, uh, which is quite an important point, the contractual setup. Now the cable pull-in system, it interfaces uh, most, if not all of the, uh, what we call tier one contractors in a, in a wind project. Uh, in itself, a critical scope, uh, the cable pull-in is a relatively small piece uh, in the context of these large contracts. So that creates a, a risk uh, and, and, and um, places big focus on, on interface management, which we will uh, talk a bit more about later. Uh, more technically, uh, they float. So compared to your bottom fixed uh, turbines, the uh, cable pull-in forces are much bigger and the loads are more dynamic. Uh, and this uh, affects uh, both the, uh, the winches and all the hardware you need to, to, to carry out this operation. Uh, you have much more challenging context of installing these systems and removing them after the pull-in is finished. And you have a, a limited uh, operational window. Uh, on uh, floating foundations, you also have very uh, small deck space. So you have a, a limited footprint for winch uh, and wire routing you have limited space for, for designing safe lifting operations. Uh, finally, compared to the, um, to the fixed uh, bottom uh, uh, turbines, the, the cost of delay or failure is, is relatively higher uh, in the floating, uh, floating wind uh, uh, cable pull-in operations. So what does this mean? Yes, uh, there are new risks to manage. Uh, I feel like I'm echoing uh, Magnus from DNV here. Uh, uh, the question again is where do we place these risks? Now the typical contract setup for these, and that's that might change over the, the coming years, but, but th this setup is more or less uh, inheritance from the fixed bottom uh, uh, developments. Uh, you have the foundation contract, they produce the foundation and typically the ring platform where uh, a winch and a cable pull-in system must be placed. You have the turbine contract, uh, which uh, in the case of this illustration here, uh, holds the sheave blocks for, uh, for cable routing. Uh, you have the uh, interarray contract. They handle the cable in the sea and uh, traditionally in, in the bottom fixed the cable pull-ins, uh, they would also execute uh, the cable pull-in uh, on the turbine foundation. Uh, you have the cable contract. Uh, the cable contractor will put limitations on how you can handle your your uh, your cable in, in in the sea, and not loads and bending radiuses uh, are allowable. And finally, you have the marine operations. Now, as I said, all these contractors have interfaces to the cable pull-in system, uh, and these are complex interfaces, uh, and it's. It's it's a complex effort bringing all this uh, this together, uh, and in that. Uh, there is a risk that the cable pulling operation uh, can um, can lose uh, lose a bit of importance. So that's what we are trying to uh, to solve. Uh, some of the key lessons uh, we've learned uh, throughout uh, our involvement uh, is uh, a strong emphasis on interface management is very important uh, as early as possible. Uh, also, again, uh, talking about the complexity, early involvement of uh, lifting and material handling expertise. Um, in addition, we also see and that's uh, an experience from the Highwind Scotland project uh, that if you design the cable pull-in system for easy installation and removal, you will save a lot of time. So finally, what we do to address these, uh, these complex issues and responding to the contractual setup is to bundle together both the hardware, uh, certification of uh, the lifting arrangement, installation of it, uh, and all that in one package. And we, uh, 
we uh, uh, rent it out. So this uh, helps the uh, risk management. Uh, it also helps reduce CapEx costs. I see my time is short, so I'll just give you a very quick sneak peek into the Highwind Tumpen project, uh, where we are currently delivering one of these uh, integrated service packages, where we package both hardware and associated services uh, into one, one package. Uh, and I think at least up until we've reached uh, big scale uh, developments, uh, these type of approaches are, are, are important uh, to, uh, to ensure the success of, uh, of the floating wind projects. And going forward, uh, our focus is to share as much as possible uh, through events like this and involvement in other projects uh, of our experiences of concrete projects uh, so that we're, we're working together with industry to bring, uh, to bring these lessons uh, forward into new projects. Thank you very much, uh, Jon. Thank you so much, uh, Sneal. Very exciting to hear. Uh, new to me, actually, exactly what you were doing there as well. So, so I'm excited to hear that you are promoting this uh, in all the markets uh, for floating wind uh, globally, like in Taiwan, potentially, uh, or in other markets in Asia as well. Now, mm -hmm. our last uh, uh, speaker uh, is Mr. Peter Reista. I saw you there for a second, Peter. Uh, Peter, sorry. Uh, you are awake in Houston, uh, no, in Austin, Texas, uh, in the US, uh, luckily, uh, and you are the project manager for uh, offshore wind at Cognite. Uh, you are developing uh, 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 some uh, rock, sorry, uh, product for mitigating environmental impact of offshore floating wind through real-time computer vision. Please, Peter, uh, the screen is yours. Uh, go ahead to tell us a bit more about that. But you have to uh, take off your mute. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. We had this challenge yesterday as well. It's a technology challenge, I believe. Can you take off your screen sharing and then uh, put it on again uh, after you have unmuted, I, I believe. Is that possible? No, I can't hear you. Um, can you... Well, just wait a couple of seconds for Petter. Uh, we've had this challenge before in terms of technology, but uh, it was solved last time. Hear me now? We can hear you now. Great. Okay. Let's see Let's if go we then. can get your screen as well. Yes. Okay. So now we can both hear me, see me, and see my screen. Excellent. We can. Very good. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so I work with the, the Norwegian technology company Cognite. Um, we. Um, we have offices around the globe. So as Leon said, I'm sitting in uh, Austin, Texas. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit early right now, but this has been a very interesting hour with lots of interesting presentations. And I'm also excited to present uh, a bit about what we're working on. So the topic for the next few minutes will be how we work with addressing some environmental issues with uh, this uh, new technology, computer vision. So what Cognite, what the, the, why Cognite exists? It's because that we see out in, in industry that uh, on large industrial assets, typically we have many different uh, source systems producing data that is siloed, not used together. It's hard to use it together. Uh, we also see this in the wind industry uh, where operators might own a uh, park with different maintenance systems, different uh, uh, sensor data systems, uh, getting data also from different weather data so uh, weather sources and uh, market data sources and one source that we see is very under underutilized is uh, is the imagery so here you see an infield worker taking a picture that's just one example you also have cctv cameras or you know higher resolution video streams or you have for example drone footage which you have seen quite a bit in 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 the wind industry especially in the offshore wind industry so computer vision is a technique that we use to uh, interpret this, this data source or to get to extract information out of the data. Typical tasks that computer vision can do is classification of images, localization of objects, detect the different objects, 
and segment uh, instances, for example. And they're getting really good at it. So this is a challenge where um, the best algorithms compete uh compete to uh, compete about uh, compete to classify um images correctly and as you can see back in 2010 they were only right in uh, 70 percent of the cases so they're working on or they're competing on a set of like a thousand different uh, uh common objects i think but um then they have gotten a lot better you can see the average uh, human is uh is does mistakes in like five percent of the cases, because you know it's kind of sometimes it's hard to see what an what object it is in a, in a in a in an image, so we're not always right, but computers are right and or increasingly uh, correct. So now we're talking. I think so. This the the last year here is 2017. They're at 2.3 percent. They are below 2 percent now. And what really accelerated the um, the improvement was that uh, we started using deep neural networks. So now we can do this computer vision real time. And this is also what, for example, Tesla is using in their uh, autonomous vehicles, um, deep neural networks. So how is this relevant to, uh, to offshore wind? Well, one of the areas where we started using this is um, working with some environmental issues. I'm now gonna quit my slides, just show you a couple of videos, what we are working on right now, actually, one of them is right off the press. Um, so just give you uh, one example of um, footage that we might have. So um, we don't we don't have cameras offshore on any uh, parks right now, but we are just simulating what this could look like. So here we have, uh, for example, uh, lots of birds, um, and we are using computer vision just to to track those. So as you can see here, so here uh, we use computer computer vision on the video stream to uh, identify the birds and also give us a, a score of how likely uh, it is or uh, how like how high probability it is that this is actually a bird. So so we have a, a few different objects uh, and uh, it uh, correctly detects this as as a bird. Um, what we are working on right now is uh, trying to differentiate between different species. So obviously, eagles are often a bigger uh, concern than, uh, for example, herring gulls. Uh, this is, uh, for example, the case in California where we are working on um, a project right now with uh, together with Aqua Offshore Wind, where this is one of the where this is one of the focuses. Uh, we're getting good at this. Uh, we can differentiate between 170 different species right now, but we need relatively high quality resolutions, and that is that is a challenge. You can solve this by having uh, installing uh, cameras that can capture video in high, high resolution that zoom in as soon as they see an emotion. But uh, you know, you gotta get around this in in, in some way because you, it's really hard to detect. Uh, a couple of hundred meters away, for example, what the species uh, would be. Um, so here's just an example that we got right now. Uh, you might have seen a clip. It's one of the few clips that exists where an eagle is getting hit by a turbine. And we see that we are able to track, even though this is really bad quality, um, we are able to track, uh, detect that this is actually a bird um, in, in some of the frames. So this is kind of, um, something to to work with Th and that was that was just uh, above water we can also use the same technique for underwater so this is since we talked about offshore wind is relevant to monitor uh, or it may be relevant to monitor the impact on the marine life in the area and we can use computer vision also on data from here it's uh, underwater video together with sonar and this is actually not done by us this is done by a partner marine c2 also working on the same project they are expert on on getting this, uh, capturing this uh, this data. So by the, by uh, the technique uh, or with the technique I'm, I've shown you now, computer vision, you can uh, put in place um, pretty good tracking of or yeah tracking of the wildlife both over water and underwater, and you can do this to uh, a very in a very cost efficient way. And just to to finish off. Um, the focus for the project that we're doing now in California is to reduce costs, to reduce OPEX, 
but what I'm showing now is just that uh, with some of the techniques that are uh, getting more and more, you know, uh, available, commoditized, you can actually address also environmental issues um, in a both both uh, cost efficient and precise way. So thank you very much. Leave it back to you, Jan. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, highly interesting it, uh, as well. And uh, with that, I want to thank uh, all our speakers uh, uh, for their contribution to this discussion. Uh, I see there are a few uh, questions outstanding, and we have not been able to uh, do questions as we went along. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, you also will be able to answer that, uh, Peter. I think it's uh, up to you, uh, the last question there. I would also just like to say that uh, thanks to all of you who has been participating uh, and that if you have interest in what we are talking about in this session, uh, speak to either me in Norway or to Miss Ivy Liu, who is our energy advisor in Taiwan. Uh, you can find her details on this screen. And before you start uh, just ending this session, Eliza, I just want to... <laughs> Uh, motivate uh, our attendees uh, with our beautiful film again. So if you allow me, uh, let us have just a couple of seconds of a uh, film to end uh, with some moti on the motivating uh, <laughs> of mastering extreme ocean conditions has given Norwegian suppliers a unique engineering and marine competence. Offshore wind energy really started in the North Sea. That is because there were good governments that really liked those type of technologies. We are proud in Norway of the creativity and innovation of the offshore energy industry. There's a new revolution coming using floating technologies for offshore wind. That will allow us to go further offshore, hunt better wind speeds in deeper waters and reduce the environmental footprint further. Our skilled supply chain is creating innovative and efficient cost reduction solutions and better services. Norway has value to add in offshore wind. We're open to collaboration and the Norwegian offshore industry's strong reputation in health and safety standards makes us a trusted partner in this global development. Norwegian offshore expertise, taking offshore wind further. So much uh, for the uh, advertisement, uh, but uh, anyway, I, I think this uh, has been a highly interesting uh, discussion and uh, thanks also to uh, Carbon Trust and GWEC for allowing us to have these discussions on uh, different challenges and potential solutions uh, for those challenges as well. And thank you to all the attendees for, for listening to us. Alisa, please. Thanks so much, John. And that was indeed a really interesting uh, presentation, uh, presentation and session on a really kind of key topic for the offshore wind sector. Um, so I'd like to thank NORWEP for organizing that session um, for all our presenters on that side event today. Um, and this was actually our, our last session, sadly, of the Global Offshore Wind Summit uh, Taiwan virtual program. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone here who has attended over the past three days, all the different panel discussions, side events, breakout sessions, you know, engaged in the networking. I would like to thank all of our event supporters and sponsors as well uh, for supporting this really important event. And we're glad we could bring so many over 600 people together on this important topic, despite of COVID-19. Um, so uh, really uh, grateful for everyone who attended. Just a reminder that all these sessions are recorded um, and you would have received a, an email this morning, again, with the link to access all the different presentations and recordings of the sessions. Uh, we'll send out another email tomorrow with that link again, um, as well as an uh, event survey. And we really encourage everyone to fill out the survey if you have five minutes so we can keep on improving our, our virtual events and, um, and give back to the industry in the way that we want to. Um, if you have any questions for our speakers, this, this um, platform is going to be live for the next hour and a half. Um, so you can still use all the networking functions. You can still visit the virtual expo. You can still chat to people using the people uh, tab over the next hour and a half. And just a reminder, of, and if you connected with anyone throughout the event, um, you can see all your connections in your Hopin account. So you can take the conversation uh, off of the platform and into uh, uh, into LinkedIn or email or however you want. So thanks everyone. 
Um, it was a really exciting event, and uh, we really hope that this will support um, an accelerating Taiwan's offshore wind market. There's, as we've seen over the past three days, there's huge potential, huge motivation, um, and now it's putting those uh, ambitions in, into action. Um, so if you have any further questions about the event um, or Taiwan's offshore wind market, please feel free to reach out to us at info at gwuk.net and we'll um, answer any questions you may have. All right, with that being said, I'll end things here. I'll leave you to go to the networking area and the expo uh, for the next hour and a half and um, look forward to seeing you at the next GWIC event.